So good morning to those of you who are here. Hopefully we have a couple more people still uh, trying to join us. I'm Carly Cixi, I work for ICU DDR, the International Consortium of Universities for Drug Demand Reduction. Very excited to have Dr. Richard Pates with us again for session number three of Publishing Addiction Science. And just a reminder to send any draft publications that you have to me um, by email, and that way we can uh, have some content to discuss in our session. Dr. Pates? Yes, thank you, Carly. Um, welcome, everybody. It's, it's nice to be back here again. Um, what we will be doing today is finishing the process of going through the paper bit by bit. So we will be talking about uh, the results section and the discussion section and references. And um, then we will talk about um, the paper that one of one of our colleagues here has submitted, Charles has submitted. Um, one of the points about um, having your paper discussed here is that it, it serves two purposes. It is good feedback for the person who's written the paper because you're getting it from a, a, a wide range of people. But also it's good for you as participants to get used to reviewing papers because um, you need when you write papers to have a very critical view of your own work and, and other people's work. So that, that is important. Um, so I thank Charles very much for what for the paper he submitted. And I'll be talking about that after the presentation. Um, we have uh, after today's session, we have another five sessions. And during those sessions, we'll be talking about things like qualitative research, um, writing review papers, writing meta analyses, reviewing papers and this sort of thing. So uh, we want to get the whole range of, of things. Um, of experience to do with publishing uh, from this workshop, but uh, I'm glad so many people are attending, and, and it's it's lovely that to uh, that to have a full international audience. I don't know where you all come from. I know where some of you come from, but it, I, I, I'm delighted that we have a good uh, international spread. Okay, um, so we're talking first about the the uh, results and discussion part. So if we can start with the slides, Carly. Yes, let me get those pulled up. I'm so working. How does that look? Oh, that's brilliant. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, this will be the results and discussion sections of the paper, of your paper, and I've also added a couple of slides on on references, which are, which is. It's a sort of thing which is easy to forget, but that's a very important part of the um, of the paper. So let's get going. Next slide, please. Results section, and this is where you report the findings of your research. So you, you we've done the the introduction, which is where you describe what the what the nature of the research is that you're doing. We've discussed the method of how you're going to do it. And now this is the results of, of what you have found in your research. It should be just a description of the results reported in a straightforward way. So it's not it's not a big elaboration. It is just the, the, the findings as you found them. Um, make sure all the hypotheses mentioned in the introduction are, are mentioned or listed. Um, and that's a problem sometimes that people get carried away with the most exciting findings, but you have to get mentioned all the hypotheses and do not overwrite or underwrite uh, this section and i'll explain that in a minute next slide please overwriting is giving excessive detail beyond what is needed for analysis or excessive weight given to non-significant results and um that's what, what i meant when i started by saying that the results section is a very much a factual um description of what you found and, and it, that, that's exactly what it is um, the business about non-significant results, some people give far too much um, notice, far too much weight to, to non-significant results, and they talk about approaching significance or nearly significant. Um, if results are not significant, they're not significant, and, and, and we, that should just be mentioned that they're not significant and left there. Underwriting is where there is just a cursory attention given to important aspects and variables of the research. And by cursory attention, I mean, it's just very briefly uh, mentioned where you actually don't really um, 
discuss what you've actually found it's 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 too it's too brief so it's actually as i say it's just the describing the results hypothesis by hypothesis uh giving the right amount of detail uh and not too much do not open the results section with a description of a sample or an analysis that is more relevant to the method section and sometimes people um will start that results section with with um, a description of, of who's in the research and, or, or what analysis they did which should be in the method section and if you remember what we talked about with the method section this is so someone else could reproduce your research as you did it next section uh, here we are avoid reporting results as approaching significance if they're not significant, uh, do not quote them as a near result. Um, and this next point is one which I'm I'm very picky on. And for my journal, um, I will send the paper back for correction if this is not quoted properly. Probabilities should be quoted as P is less than 0 0.5 or 0 0.001, etc., and not as an exact number. What you have to remember, the, the word probabilities mean that this is a probable result. So therefore, it is not an exact result, and and it's too often um, I get papers where people have quoted extensively with these exact figures, and we have to change them. Um, if they're not significant, then the result is NS, not significant. Next slide. Um, start your results with your main findings, and then report the less important ones. Make sure you report all the significant findings. Um, use tables and figures to illustrate um, the points, but do not use too many. Um, one of the problems I find sometimes is people put in um, seven or eight tables, seven or eight figures, and these these it's not necessary for two reasons. One is it's it's too much for someone to read, but secondly, it takes up a lot of space. And one of the things you have to remember is that all journals have a page budget from their publishers. So if I have so many pages of, of figures and tables, then it's maybe stopping someone else from publishing their paper. Um, next slide, and I think we're on to discussion then. Discussion, okay. This is the section where the results you've reported in the previous section are discussed and the relevance of the findings put into the context. And this is a really important section because, because you've described what the problem is, you've described how you're gonna do it, you've described the results, and now you're, you're talking about the relevance of it. How does what you have found fit into the world of science as it is at present? How does it fit in? So it's it's not just a, an abstract thing. It is very much a group of real people that you've researched or, or a phenomenon you've researched, and it fits into that world of science. What's new about your findings? Um, nearly all uh, research which is published has something new in it if you're just repeating someone else's research and getting the same results you're unlikely to get it get it published remember there could be different interpretations of your results and ensure you discuss these and that is that's a very interesting point because sometimes people come at research from a, a point of view where they have a very um, fixed view of it of what the problem is and don't discuss alternative findings or alternative interpretations when they um, uh, when they were in the discussion. So that's important that you know there's are there other reasons why this these results have turned out as they have. Uh, next slide. I'm clicking. It's just taking a minute, I guess. Right. Whereas in the results section, you have just reported the results as they, as they have occurred. In this section, you want to interpret the results. So the results section is, is a very factual thing. This is what we found. This is what was significant. This is what was not significant. Take into account the study's hypothesis and the sources of potential bias or imprecision. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, but it's important that you're very open about um, what, what has happened in your research and how, what you've found. One of the interesting things about doing uh, psychological research and especially addiction research 
is that we work with with human beings um, and working with human beings gives us lots of, of um, opportunity for difference and for um, different people's experiences. So there may be sources of bias in that or imprecision, and you, you need to discuss these. Are the findings generalizable? Do they have external validity? And what that means is, um, could you uh, say that these results apply to the rest of the community, to the rest of the world, to the rest of the population? Um, sometimes you will find that uh, if someone has, for example, only used women in a research or only used men, just use one, one gender, then you have to question whether you could generalize that across across all populations because that's not necessarily the case in other examples you might have a culture in a country like if you look at a country like iran where there is a very um strict prohibitions on alcohol for religious reasons um then you may get very different findings than you would in a country like america or the uk when there are no such restrictions so you have to be careful that can i generalize these findings and uh, a general interpretation of the results in the context of the current evidence. What is the current evidence and what have you found and how does that fit in? Next slide. Although speculation about the importance of the results is, of course, part of the discussion, limit to what is reasonable and likely. Um, you can, some people do get carried away and make all sorts of claims, which is which is not which is, which is not valid, and that's important. Um, secondly, avoid introducing literature into this section. That's one thing I find quite a lot with papers I received. People or the, the literature should be in the introduction and not into this section, um, unless you have found something which wasn't mentioned in the uh, introduction um, or. You, you weren't expecting and you may find that you you want to follow that up with with um someone else has, has found something similar um the discussion should be about the results in the context not introducing new new, new um points there and if you comment on policy avoid this becoming a, a political rant it removes the seriousness of your findings and one of the things about working in addiction is it is a very political area um in 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 my in my uh, working lifetime we had the context of things like um hiv and hepatitis and there was way back when i wrote, first started running a service there was a big debate about um new things like needle exchanges and we had all sorts of difficulties with with politicians um about that sort of thing now, if you're writing something which is about policy it's important that you remain objective and you don't become sort of very uh, carried away with it. Um, it. It adds it adds much more validity to your argument if you remain calm and, and stick to the, stick to the actual findings. Next slide. Conclusions. Um, at one time, conclusions and limitations would have been part of the discussion section. Uh, nowadays, it's more common to have a separate conclusions and limitations sections conclusion section is really a re re reiteration of the points of the discussion the main points of the discussion and the emphasis of the main findings of the research and their importance uh, it should be short and punchy so basically what you're doing is writing a paragraph which puts your work into the context of, of the current current thing but it should be saying why your work is important and it, and it, it it's um in a sense, it's a good way to round off a paper because you you leave the paper, the reader leaves the paper saying that this was important and, and that's something there that uh, you would hope for in your research. Uh, next slide. Limitations. Um, limitation section describes what the limitations of the study were and, for example, how generalizable they might be. Um, it's an important section because studies, perfect studies are rare, especially when we're dealing with the vagaries of human beings and even more so on the subject of substance use, which is what I just said a, a few minutes ago. Um, it, it's important that you highlight that there are there are 
limitations because every research has some limitations. And what's more in, is that the reviewers of the paper will pick up on the flaws. So it's better if you point them out rather than trying to hide them. So um, if you, uh, for example, may have a limited population or um, because of, of the size of the problem or um, your access to them or um, uh, maybe the, the, the methodology wasn't perfect. So it, it just point out what the limitations are. Next slide. Describe the suboptimal aspects of your research. Do not see it as a sign of weakness, but rather as a strength. Uh, you've tried to undertake a good piece of research, and sometimes because of, for example, unavailability of your cross section of subjects or an unexpected confounding variable, the research may not be perfect. It, it rarely is. And it is one of the huge frustrations about doing research in this area. It's not like doing something with, um, say, if you're if you're doing something which may be, um, uh, if you're doing research on animals or, or research on um, something much more simple, it, it, it may be, you know, that you don't have those, those um, examples. But, but in our research, we often have we hit problems, things aren't perfect, and, and it's, it's much better that you mention that when at the start. Okay, next slide. Do not be ingratiating, do not apologize or promise not to do this in the future. You're signaling to your peers that you're aware of limitations and you know what is good practice in research. Um, and this is what I've just mentioned, a major problem is often from generalizing uh, from a limited population to the population in general, e.g. by gender, ethnicity or, or age, etc. And it's one of the things that I find, again, quite interesting that people sometimes talk about uh, young people, research and especially with substance use. And then you look at the um, age range of people that they've used and they've used everything from 15 to 40. Well, I don't regard people of 40 as being young. You know, we're talking about either adolescence, which is a particularly interesting time because it is um, the time when young people do experiment and get exposed to things. Um, then young adulthood where they may be getting married or be in relationships, you know, becoming parents. But by the time of 40, they're certainly not young people still. So just be careful about how you describe the, the population you're researching. Next slide. References, and, and I put in this section of references because it really is uh, important. And one of the things that does happen is people make uh, mistakes with references. They uh, don't, um, they, they're not thorough enough. So basically there are two styles of referencing, the Harvard or APA style or the Vancouver style. Harvard style has references in the text with just the names and dates of the authors only one or two names, e.g. Jones 2020 or Jones and Smith 2021, whatever. If there are more than two authors, use Jones et al. 2022. The references and the reference list should be list, uh, should be in alphabetical order. So um, they're in alphabetical order from the name of the first author. In the Vancouver style, there is a number in the text without the name and the reference list. Uh, sorry, and in the reference list, put these in numerical order in the order which they appear in the text. Um, and it's important because one of the things that you find sometimes is people mix up the styles. So I get papers sometimes with a with a Harvard style where people have put in the references in the text and then they put them in a numerical order in the reference list. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, all journals use one style or other, so uh, but never both. So get it right before you submit. And if you go to the instructions for authors on the the website of that journal, um, they'll always tell you which style they use. Um, but it's, as I say, if you get, if you've got used the wrong style, they'll just send your paper back and ask you to change it, and it, it, it's a waste of your time and their time. Mm -hmm. Do not use too many references to make a point. Sorry, that should be to make a point. For example, in the introduction, um, one or two are sufficient. And so, so sometimes, I mean, I had a paper the other day 
which was, I can't remember what it was about, but it was talking, in the introduction it made a point and it referenced the points, which is, was very good, but on one point about one thing that was that was true, they had eight references, and that's totally unnecessary. It's difficult to read, um, and it takes up more space. Uh, before you submit, check that the references in the text are all in the reference list, and that all that are in the list are in the text. Uh, and and that, that is important because um, you don't want that sent back. It, it, it's the small details like this which, which actually increase the chance of you getting your paper accepted or not getting sent back. And sometimes you, I, I do find, because I, I read a lot of papers, I sometimes find that there are mistakes in these. I don't know what that is, Carly. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can. Anyway, I think I think that's the last slide. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, questions, points people want to make? I think Dr. Gladys, we, we didn't hear that, but I think you're, you have a question to share. Yes, I want to appreciate Richard. I want to appreciate these great teachings that you're giving us. We are learning you, a Dennis. lot. Yeah, this is Gladys from Kenya and um, we really appreciate how you are taking us through these teachings so that you're able to publish and publish uh, acceptable documents. So I just want to appreciate. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say, to say so, Gladys. One of the, the interesting things about, and one of the reasons we run these is that um, getting a paper published is, can, can be very important for people's careers. And, and obviously, if you've done some research, and Maria was talking about that before we, when we first started, it, you know, you want to get it out into the world if you found something interesting. Um, one of the things that's not taught very well at, at universities or anywhere is how to write a paper. And it's, it's all of these um, webinar sessions that we're doing are not particularly complicated, but it's important that we get a structure right so that people can get them right. And, and um, I have been a, an editor for about 20, 22 years or something. So I've read an awful lot of paper over the years and, and you see the mistakes people make. Um, so it's really, uh, I'm uh, the other thing that I'm very keen on is getting um, papers from, from um, low and middle income countries because often you're neglected and I think they need to be more into the, um, into the world of, 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 of publication. Um, but I would say that both, you know, it, the problem of getting it right for in terms of um, uh, right for a paper, it's, just, it's the same in British and American universities as well. So it's, it's a problem all over the world of getting it, getting your paper, getting your research done so you can get it, get it published. And uh, I'm delighted that, that you're all interested in doing this. So thank you. And Dr. Brett has volunteered. She's going to send us a paper. So thank you, Dr. Excellent. Well done. If there's no more comments, um, we'll, what we're going to move on to is Charles's paper. Charles very kindly sent a paper, um, and what what we what we'd like to do, or what we've done in the past, is actually share the paper so you can all see them and review them, and have experience of that. Um, you probably haven't had time to read this paper because it is quite long, um, but but uh, I wanted to discuss it and thank Charles very much for sending it because it, it is brave to expose yourself to all these people while the, 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 the paper is, is uh, before the paper is published. The first thing I'd say about it is it's a very well written paper. It is um, on a very interesting subject um, and I think it is um, it certainly it does need some changes but it certainly will be publishable when it is uh, revised. So certainly I'm, I'm um, uh, delighted that Charles sent it. What it is about, it is about um, community uh, efforts to control methamphetamine use. 
And one of the interesting things is about methamphetamine is that uh, when I started working in the drugs field, um, amphetamine was a big problem in the part of the world that I live in, in South Wales in the UK. But it wasn't methamphetamine, it was amphetamine sulfate, which is less strong and not so much of a problem in terms of consequences. What we do know now, and I, and I get papers from certainly from Africa, from Asia, from many places describing the problems with methamphetamine, and it is clearly a, um, a developing and a major problem. Anyway, Charles has written a paper on 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 um, uh, community interventions uh, for amphetamine methamphetamine use and. It, this is a, basically a systematic review paper. As I say, the paper is very, very interesting. That it is um, well, generally well written, um, but it does have a couple of things that I would pick up um, to ask Charles to consider. Firstly, the the abstract, as you can see on that page, there is quite long, and we would normally ask for abstracts of around two hundred and fifty words. That is about three hundred and something, I think. And the findings are perhaps a bit, a little too long there, and they could, it could be pared down. The paper itself is quite long, um, and it is, I think I worked out about five, um, 4,800 words, nearly 5,000 words. That's excluding abstracts, references, and tables and diagrams. Now, all journals have a page budget for their publishers, and um, I, I usually ask for papers between 3,000 and 3,500 words. What I do say, though, is that for certain papers, like qualitative research, tend to take more space, and, and review papers tend to take more space as well. And it's always worth, if your paper is a bit longer, is to write to the editor to say, look, I've written this paper. It is a review paper or a qualitative paper, so it is a bit longer than your 3,500 words. Um, is that acceptable? And I would usually make, um, I, would, I would certainly consider it. Um, I, I, if I get a paper of 6,000 words, I can't publish that because it is much too long. Um, this paper is slightly too long, and I, and I would su suggest to Charles that he checks before he submits it to a journal is what their word length is and whether that, that'll be a problem. Some journals that don't have um, not particularly fussy about word length, some are. Um, so that's one interesting point. Um, about the paper itself, um, there are some bits of language which are not quite scientific. When he was talking about looking at research, looking at papers, he used the word scouted rather than searched, and I would change that. So I would go through the paper to make sure that all the language is scientific. <coughs> um, he also discusses the clinical uses of methamphetamine. And I wanted to raise this because I, uh, because he says that it is used for narcolepsy, obesity and ADHD. Now, my memory of working with young people was that they used to use a drug called methylphenidate, which is a clinical drug. And I'm not sure it is exactly the same as methamphetamine. So I think we need to be careful about quoting what uh, drugs which may be similar but not are not the same because it's a very it's a different thing than than um, illicitly produced methamphetamine. Um, there's another. There was another thing about language when he was talking about government outfits rather than government departments or government organisations. It's these sort of things which are very small, but need to be considered because they may come back. The paper may come back to you. <clears throat> um, one of my one of my um, points of principle is that I don't use the word abuse in terms of my papers. We talk about drug use and drug users, and the reason for this is that I think abuse is a not helpful term. It's it can be pejorative. People can see that as being very critical of someone. But the fact is that people use drugs, they use, they use drugs and whether they use them dangerously or use them carefully, they use drugs. I used to smoke cigarettes many years ago, but I never regarded myself as a tobacco abuser. So if people send me a paper with the word abuse in it, I'll ask them to change it to, to use or user. Um, some people may not be so fussy, but that, that's my, my view. 
Um, again, one on language on one point, you've just put in the word meth rather than methamphetamine, and you need to make sure that things are spelt out properly. The, <clears throat> the, the one point that I thought was interesting and wanted to discuss with Charles or wanted to him to think about <clears throat> is basically he's talking about prevention in the community. And what I learned from his paper is that there seems to be in different countries, of course, there seems to be different approaches and there's a wide range of approaches. And in some parts of the world, there is a very, um, what's the word, a, a, a very strict code and they use them, they, they punish them. So it, he talked about, I think in Nigeria, about a night, uh, about, um, using corporal punishment on people who were using or dealing, um, talking about um, drug gangs being broken up, being drug supplies, being where drugs are made, being broken up. So that's a, a punitive approach. But on the other hand, there is the approach of, a, of where people are looking at, how can we help people stop? How can we get people into communities? So I think it's worth perhaps separating the different and, 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 and explain that there are two different approaches. One one is very punitive and one is much more um, associated with being part of a community and how can we help people with these problems. And it is interesting because in different countries of the world there, there as I've said before, there are such different views on drugs um, and ab about how we deal with drug use. So I certainly know that in the Philippines, you know, uh, under the, the last president that they were you know, even to about death penalty for drug dealers um and certainly in america uh, in in back in the 50s and 60s there were very strict and punitive uh, uh, treatments for drug users um so the, 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 there is a community approach has different meanings so i think it's worth worth actually looking at those and perhaps dividing up the the community approaches into those that are punitive and those that are friendly but as I said at the beginning, generally, it's a very well written paper. It is um, it is interesting because I I haven't seen anything like this before. Uh, and it certainly is is worth publishing once he's made some minor corrections to it. So thank you very much, Charles. And I certainly appreciate it. And I will jot my comments down to you in an email as well. So I don't know if anyone else has had a chance to read or a chance to think or anything, but um, any thoughts on that? Charles, did you have anything that you wanted to share? I saw that your microphone went off mute for a moment. PowerPoint presentation is quite interesting. Really a book accounting. I also have to review points that really look at them down. Um, I will really back to these points. With the issue of dividing Trinity Baptist and putting them together Oh, I'm trying so hard to hear, but I can't. Can you hear Richard? Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't really. I heard any any parts. Charles, you even if you want to type something in chat, then I can read it out for the group. Um, if that works for you, I'm sorry that we're having a connection issue. Can you hear me better now? Oh, that sounds much better. <laughs> yes. So it's better now, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So I just wanted to appreciate Richard for his um, insights in the presentation. I really, really learned a lot from the PowerPoint, and it's good that we have it in the email. It's going to help me to revise and put things quite in an organized way. So I really appreciate Richard. And um, the points he has raised in the paper, I really, really appreciate them. Um, systematic reviews tend to be long. By the time you throw through papers, read through a lot of things, and you're trying to concise them in a single paper, it, it, it tends to take quite 
the length. I will see what I can do to shorten them. Uh, on the issue of um, punitive versus community supportive approaches, um, the, the problem I'm having there is that it looks as if Nigeria is the only country standing out in this punitive approach. I didn't quite see the literature of people who are going hard on methamphetamine users is is Nigeria. And, and actually that was what prompted me to begin to look at, I'm from Nigeria and the drug recently came into popularity here. And what we saw was this harshness, people flogging, beating, sometimes even killing people who used the drug. So I wanted to see are there other things people are doing around the globe that we are more humane and more supportive. So Nigeria seems to be a bit of an exception, you know, in this issue. So I, so it may not be helpful for me to separate just one country to talk about their approach. What do you think is worth it? I I, I think that, that thank you, Charles. That was really helpful. I think that you you make a point in your paper, which is quite right, is that there is not a lot of literature on it. So one of the problems I suspect in in that there will be um, other countries that are punitive, um, but there may not be papers on it. And 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 I think your paper has real, really important significance because it is an increasing problem. Um, and as you say that there are the, the, in the paper that there are sort of inpatient or pharmacological approaches, or not many actually. But you know, community approaches are really important, and and I was delighted with you know the the the, the approach you took. So uh, really useful, really helpful, um, and and that's one of the things that I think is great about this series of webinars is if we can discuss your papers, and and for other people, if if you are uh, happy to let us have your papers in advance and let other people discuss them, it is really helpful for you because you will actually learn from our colleagues here. Um, but no, generally, Charles, I mean, when I when you know, the criticisms that I make are very, fairly minor in terms of what is a, a, a very good piece of work. And, and as I say, it was well, well written, well structured. Um, there was a couple of very small stylistic things like um when you submit you should really submit in double spacing um and i think when i look through i think some of the references were in a different style size font um minor minor details but it's you know make sure that everything's neat and tidy because it makes a huge difference in terms of getting papers accepted but thank you no I'm, i was really grateful and i will email you uh, later about it Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I, I mean, what is interesting is, is that some of you have produced papers like Charles. Some of you, like Maria, are saying, I'd like to do some research and, you know, this is possible. And I'm very happy to encourage you to do that. And don't forget that once these series of webinars are over, if you have my email, I'm very happy to stay in touch with you and provide you with any help that you want. So it's not just for the duration of the time we're here. It's, it's an ongoing thing. Um, and it, it, it is really um, very helpful if you can submit papers, that you're, if you're doing papers at the moment, even if they're not fully written up. You know, I'm happy to use the group to, to help you do that. And one of the lovely things about this group is that you come from all over the world. It is a very mixed group and, and therefore different people have different experiences. It's not all the same. It's not, you know, um, if you all came from the from the UK or from America, it would be different. But you don't you come from different backgrounds and you have very different experiences. Um, and I suspect different substances. I mean, I think what uh, Maria was talking about about antihistamines was really interesting. Um, Charles was just talking about the difference with um, the punitiveness in Nigeria for for methamphetamine. So, your experiences um, related to your own countries and cultures are interesting to to the rest of us, and, and I'm very glad to share them. Any other thoughts or comments?
we have about nine minutes, I think, really. Can I ask a question, Richard? Of course you can, Carly. In today's slides, you said, don't be political, you know, don't be overly political in your writing. But when uh, Charles talks about something like uh, punitive versus humane approaches, right, that has political implications. So the way that the researcher handles it then is to talk about the research and outcomes. Is that is that sort of how that that is negotiated? Yes, now that's a very interesting question. And and you're quite right, because Charles mentioned about the the situation. But I think one of the interesting things is is, and again, Charles points out in his paper that there are very few outcome findings from prevention research, which is a true generally, I think. So you know, if you come from a country where it is very punitive, that may be political, and it's worth commenting on, but what you don't want to do is to say, this is the way it should be, this is the best way to go forward. So you're not taking a side on it, you're just commenting on the fact that in this culture, this happens, in this culture, that happens. And I think one of the very interesting things about, you know, I think what Charles has done is is potentially to start a debate on you know how, how do we how do we assess prevention it's a really difficult thing to do and what was interesting when we were at the conference in Abu Dhabi um that was basically about prevention a lot of it was about prevention um one thing that came to me has been quite clear is very hard to measure prevention how much does it work um because one of the things that that we that we know from um or countries like america really when you had a dea head by harry anslinger back in the what 30s 40s 50s um it didn't stop drug use um it, it much marginalized more people and there was a racial element to it as well so you know it can be a very difficult thing um but i think the question that charles raises is, is, is you know does does prevention work does community action community prevention work and if it does what's the best way to do it so I think, sorry, that's a long, a long winded answer to your question, Carly, but that basically um, do mention the, the political side in, sense, in the sense of saying, yes, this happens here and this happens here, but don't take sides on it unless you have good evidence. I mean, if there was good evidence that, that by beating up drug users, then you stopped all the drug use in the country, then you might be able to say that. But of course, there is no evidence of that. Um, you know, in the same way as, as Harry Anstinger's policies didn't work, but, um. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's a really interesting one. There's a hand going up. Is that Maria? Okay, she's having a hard time, um, unmuting. How's that Maria? Yes, um, I was just going to follow up what Carly said. Uh, you mentioned also about the Philippines in 2016, that was really the total drug war. Uh, that was actually, you know, it was dragged into politics uh, upon the winning of the president, the outgoing president. And, um, you know, I, I would like to, to congratulate you, Charles, for having that courage to really write about it, so that so that your co your colleagues around the world will have that uh, you know will have the courage to work uh, uh, to talk about these things, the punitive aspect of prevention, uh, all of this. These are usually not talked about. In fact, I'm also guilty of that. You just kept silent because you fear for your life. That's one of the uh, difficult things when you talk about this. Um, it's it's a good platform to put it in a study with evidence. And I think no one can fault us there. I'm inspired by your work, Charles, because I also was on the front line to, to help those who have been victimized by a very punitive approach to prevention. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, um, uh, Carly, because it's, it's, it's something that's still happening, but nobody talks about it. And that ha also have a courage to, to work on it because their lives could be in danger with the authorities. 
So yes, <laughs> but there are a few of us who are working, uh, just doing the work, and nothing to do with politics. I think we are on the safe side. Thank you for your comments, Maria. That, that is really valuable and it's really nice to hear that from you. And, and I think it is a fascinating subject because, uh, as you say, one of the problems is if you live in a very community, sorry, punitive culture, then you, by raising the issue, you can be punished yourself. And, and that's something you don't want. Yeah, exactly. That's why most workers in the field do not really talk about it. Mm. Uh, I hope with the, the, the incoming, we'll have better options in helping <laughs> our um, in helping our SUDs. So we are, I, I work with a private center, so it's it's not too pre less pressure on me. But if you work in government, you have to follow, and 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 you put yourself. Uh, at this, in a situation where you will not have work, <laughs> you'll be terminated from your work, and that's really bad. Thank you, Maria. That's really important to hear. And that's one of the lovely things about this 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 webinar that we we get the experience of different you, know, Charles from Nigeria, from you, from other people, and I really appreciate that because none of us. You know, we all know about the world and what's happening, but we don't have that that experience of working in those places. I mean, I've never been to the Philippines. I've, I've done some work in Nigeria, but um, I really appreciate hearing your firsthand experience, and and it is so valuable. And it's also, you know, it does it does impact on research you do because you you know your your research can have important implications. You know, and uh, so. Yes, I'll encourage you all to do research. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, doctor. So Thank you, Maria, for the kind words as well. Um, sorry, I just have to add in, in Nigeria, we, we have this, we have so many problems. And when we have these drug problems, people, I mean, the government will not go after you. We don't have the situation in Philippines or where it is heavily politicized, criticize the government. In Nigeria, you can criticize the government. Nobody would go after you, so to speak. But um, they may they may put you. So 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 if you reveal damaging things about them, they may come for you. But when your research is exposing societal problems, they may not have too much of a problem with you until someone personally feels. You are infringing in their office or you are castigating their efforts, and then they may come after you. But for now, we feel safe shouting our problems over the rooftops, and nobody really, really, you know, worries. I've done more daring things, I would say, in terms of writing on crimes, say, internet fraudsters, people who are really desperate and they can even come for you when they feel your writings are against them. But for now, with regards to the drug I'm writing about, um, the, the government is really looking for a solution as well. So they will be happy to see perspectives towards it. Thank you very much, Charles. Okay. Very good. Should we wrap up, Dr. Pates? Yes, I think we should. We, we've reached the end. But just to encourage people to submit their papers to Carly, we have five more sessions. Um, and, and I think it is really useful for, for us, for you, and for the individual writing the paper. So thank you very much for your, your comments today. It, the, the, the webinar goes much better when you participate and, and certainly with Charles and, and Gladys and Maria, very grateful to you for talking, but please everyone feel free to join in. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Pates. I'll follow up with my usual email to everyone with the slides and the recording. So thank you. Brilliant. So Thanks very much.